Well, Merry Christmas, everyone, whether you're joining us at Lake Cities or our Denton campus. I just want you to know how honored we are that you would choose to spend a part of your holiday with us. My name is Toby. I'm one of the pastors here, and I think probably the greatest gift I could give you this Christmas Eve is a, is a very short little message uh, for you and for me and to remember the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, and especially to remember the relevancy of his coming in each one of our lives. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard a pastor or a church leader say this, but, you know, God's ways are weird. I mean, really, when you think about it, like God is weird. He's strange. He's different. When Isaiah says, for my ways are not your ways as far and as high as heaven is from the earth, that's how far my thoughts are above your thoughts. The Toby translation of that is, man, God is weird. He does not do it like we do it. And when you read the Bible, like a lot of people I know quit reading the Bible because the Bible's weird. I mean, it really is when you start reading the Bible about, hey, I'm gonna, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to form an entire nation out of you, Abram, and He's 90 plus years old and he takes matters into his own hands literally. But God still says, you know, this is the way I'm going to begin to build a nation. I think about Gideon in the Old Testament. And I mean, it's a cool story, but come on, man, it's weird. I mean, you got 32,000 troops. Let's get it down to 300 and then we're going to go to battle. That's strange. That's different. And yet, if you took every story in the Bible and you piled them up, they would not compare to the strangeness of how Jesus chose to save the world. I think about John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11 when, when he says, he's in prison, he sends word back to Jesus and he says, hey, are you the one that they've been prophesying about? It even seemed weird to him that Jesus was God's chosen vessel to save the world. And if you've gone to church a part of your life, any of your life, or your whole life, you know that although everything that was prophesied about Jesus' arrival, you find in the Old Testament, even in those days, those people thought it was the strangest thing on the planet. No one was believing it. They weren't believing who God had chosen for his parents. That God chose to save the world and he was going to use a teenage Jewish peasant girl that would be whispered about in her hometown as being the parent of an illegitimate child. Uh, I was thinking about my friend Bob Goff who said not too many weeks ago that God tells Mary that she's going to give birth before she tells Joseph and about how it got weird between Mary and Joseph. That was a strange plan why didn't he tell them both at the same time it, it was just different it was it's strange really that he would announce his arrival to shepherds to those who would be in culture distinctly unqualified to be the receivers of that message and yet those are who he chose for a baby to be born in Bethlehem that was called the city of bread. It was, it, was, it was a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. And yet, this is how God chose to save the world. Because God's ways, like they're different, they're strange. I mean, it's weird. But the encouraging part... <laughs> of the strangeness of God's ways that you see through Scripture, I think epitomized in the life of Jesus, is not that Jesus did those things, it's that Jesus is doing those things still in our lives. The fact of the matter is, the theme over the coming of Christ is about God's weird sense of timing. That his people would wait 400 years. And some of you this Christmas Eve, you find yourself waiting for something. 
you can find no human concept for why God hasn't acted yet. His story is about using not those who are qualified, but those who are available. And maybe you find yourself this Christmas season disqualified. The story is about God doing things that we would never imagine in ways that we would never imagine him doing it. Because his ways are not our ways. And the story of Christ coming and Christ redeeming and Christ working, not simply 2,000 years ago, but in today's world is this. God is always at work. And God's character and nature is for our good. And you're, many of you are like me. You will never understand this side of heaven, why God has waited, why God hasn't said yes, why God hasn't simply worked things out the way you want them to work out but the cradle in the cross declares God's faithfulness and intentionality in using even the broken things of our lives to do something good I think that's my favorite thing about having a front row seat for 19 years in watching in people's lives God do good stuff out of really bad stuff I've watched God takes, take men and women's really poor decisions and take what the enemy meant for evil and God use it and leverage it for good I've gotten to watch people who have day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year ask God for something that makes no sense for him to say no to. And he still hasn't said yes. And I've seen God do something in people's hearts in spite of them not receiving their greatest desire. And there are literally, not preacher count, like literally hundreds of stories of the weird ways of God bringing good stuff out of really bad stuff around this place. And this year, I want to share a story that's especially near and dear to my heart of a dear, dear friend here at Cross Timbers who got some really bad news this year and has seen God take this challenging situation and do something good. Let's watch this. I remember it's, it's been a little over a year ago, about mid-November, and I started having all these symptoms. I started having this extreme muscle pain and weakness in my thighs and in my arms and my shoulders, and I just, I really couldn't like raise my, my hands above my head. If I dropped something on the ground, it just took this Herculean effort to get down there and pick it up. And so a couple of days before Christmas, 
Um, I went to see my doctor, started telling him what was going on, and, and he looked at me, and he, start, he starts typing on his laptop, and then he'd look over at me, and then he'd type some more, and then, and I thought, man, he's kind of worried about this. He looks worried. So I asked him, I said, okay, doc, so with your concern meter, the like one to 10, like, where are you? And he said, well, I'm about a seven. You got something happening? and we need to find out what it is. So I'm gonna send you to some specialist, and we're gonna have some tests done, and we're gonna find out what's going on. So I got the appointment with the neurologist, and I went to see her, and she said, we're gonna, we're gonna do these tests. We're gonna take MRIs of your brain, and of your back, and of your lower body, and she said, do, do those tests, and I'll call you. So I was pulling in our driveway, and had just gotten there, and I was about to get out of the car, and the phone rang, and it was the neurologist's office. And she said, hey, we've got your results, your um, brain scan, everything's good on that. And your spinal scan, everything's great on that. But there was one issue we did find. And she said, completely unrelated to your other symptoms, um, we saw this mass on your right kidney. And it's what we call renal cell carcinoma. It's kidney cancer. And so you need to get to an oncologist as fast as possible. And so I did, I found an oncologist who also referred me to a urologist. There were a lot of ologists in my world at that time. The urologist said, yeah, it's kidney cancer and we need to have surgery. And um, when we got done, the surgeon, he said, hey, everything went great. He said, there's a 95% chance that it, that it won't come back. Just recently, even more good news, I had my six month um, MRI, my scan. Everything is clean and he says I'm cancer free. So that's all. Fantastic news, and I'm super grateful. What about like the pain and the weakness though that started this whole deal? Well, I wish I had like a nice tidy little bow that I could tie on that story. The fact is the, the muscle pain and the weakness, it's still there. What I learned about kidney cancer is that there really are no symptoms to it until it's like really in the later stages and it gets really bad. Doctors almost always find kidney cancer while they're looking for something else. To be clear, like I, I wouldn't choose pain and weakness as the way to get my attention. Like it was a it was a strange and unnatural way to really discover a bigger problem in my life. But here's the thing: God's way isn't our way, but his way is always eventually a good way. And really the better way and, and really even the best way to live our life. So I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking what I'm thinking. Which is, well, why did he have to get sick in the first place? So get ready. I'm going to give you a deeply theological answer. I have no idea. Because God's ways are weird. <laughs> They're strange. He doesn't do it the way I would do it. But I will tell you this. If Kent's neuro condition had not deteriorated to the point that he went to see a doctor, trust me, the boy does not like to go to the doctor. And if the doctor wouldn't have sent him to a personal friend of mine who is in the neuro business and is over the top in her evaluation of patients. He would have never had that MRI that he was fighting having where they would have found that mass on his kidney. And for those of you who have suffered the pain of losing one to kidney cancer, as you know, and as Kent said, if they wouldn't have found that mass that early, Kent's prognosis would not have been good. What a strange way to work in his life. See, the Christmas story is not a history story about hope in the past. It's about what God is doing that brings hope in the present.
Christmas is about believing that though his ways are not our ways, that he is in work, at work to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ask or imagine because his promise is true that he meets all of our needs according to the glorious riches found in the baby born in Bethlehem. No wonder they call him wonderful. Let's pray together. So Lord, I wouldn't have chosen to bring redemption and restoration and deliverance the way you brought it, but I'm glad you chose it that way. And I wouldn't choose the pain and the disappointment and the detours that so many of us have taken. But I can say with faith that you have walked with us through those moments. And I'm grateful, Lord, that the birth of Christ reminds us that even though your ways may be strange, that your kingdom comes and your will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. And so we thank you for choosing the strange things to bring good things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.